nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, so today what I really wanted to talk about, while everyone has um, given a great discussion on thin film synthesis and all the things that can happen there uh, with respect to their growth um, and their dynamics, um, what I sort of wanted to focus on was more um, exfoliated materials, uh, as Sammy mentioned. Um, so why are we actually interested in 2D materials um, in general? Um, I think really to sort of hit this on the head, um, is that the idea is that we have a flavor for everyone, right? Um, that we hope that this field can evolve into something where we can make it to where we can produce flexible electronics, where we can produce light emitting devices, or we can produce ferroelectric FETs, which is sort of this new schematic um, for neuromorphic com uh, computing, or where we can tune correlated states, um, like in these twisted heterostructures, um, or even explore new topology um, where we don't even know the outcome quite yet. Um, now, unfortunately, what that also means is that we really, really, really need to approach high quality. Because if we don't approach high quality and we try to approach something as simple as just light emission from a direct band gap material, right? we want to make a flexible device out of this or we want to do anything with it, um, ultimately what we'll find is that we have very low quantum yields. And what this ultimately translates to is that we have very inefficient devices um, that are going to be very inhomogeneous and vary from device to device fabrication. And this is a problem if you're going into industry. Device to device variation can basically kill your product line. Um, and just for a few examples here, um, WS2 on quartz has something like quantum yield of 0.6%. Um, to you know, roughly uh, sample variation, maybe as high as 6%, you encapsulate it in VN. Um, it's known as one of the best um, quantum yield materials that you can just buy on the market um, and making from CVD. MS2 is gonna be lower, something like 0.1, maybe the very best 1%. And WSE2, um, though we expect a low quantum yield because its lowest energy state is a dark exciton, um, still, it's on the order of 0.1%. And so uh, can we actually make these things better? How do we actually go about doing that? Um, and so that's sort of the um, industrial side or the application side of how we want things to, to sort of pan out or why we want to make things better or cleaner. On the physics side, why we want to make things cleaner uh, is we want to explore new states, right? As we make things cleaner, as we increase mobility, like in gallium arsenide, we can go from sort of just measuring um, simple oscillations like Shevnikov de Haas and looking at effective masses, all the way up to seeing these sort of fractional quantum Hall effect, those first observations in the 1980s, um, and then to the more recent 2000s, fractional quantum Hall effects, which ultimately we hope to abuse for non-abelian statistics for things like braiding and quantum information science. Um, now, a lot of these things are still very far away, which is why they're still in the regime of physics. But nonetheless, we care about exploring these things and understanding their behavior. And in order to do that, we really need to boost the quality. Now, what are the things that are limiting this in 2D? So a lot of the things that limit this in 2D deal with just charge scattering by disorder. And so uh, just to take for an example, MOS2, uh, even in a very high dielectric environment, you're going to have a scattering potential that's on the order uh, of you know, half a nanometer or so um, on the very best case scenario. And even if you have defect densities on the order of, say, 5 times 10 to the 11th, you're still limited to a few thousand uh, centimeter uh, squares per volt seconds in terms of your mobility which means if you want to observe something like the quantum Hall effect, that's going to be extremely difficult. And it, basically, everything with your device has to be absolutely perfect uh, going into it to make it work out. Um, unfortunately, most materials end up lying in this regime here. right? So most of the materials that people work with, like CBD or um, things purchased on the commercial market, are around 10 to the 13th per centimeter squared in terms of their overall defect density. And so what that means is that even if you make the most perfect device, say HVN encapsulated, absolutely no nanobubbles at all, 
um, no absorbase between the layers, um, and you push this to relatively high fields, you still won't see full quantization, i.e. A, a nice uh, flat plateau in the, in the hall, um, or a dip to basically zero if you're measuring VXX um, and a four-point configuration. And so ultimately, if you want these sort of, um, if you want to measure the ground states of these materials, it's going to be very problematic. Now, what are the things that contrib contribute to these problems? Um, so in 2D, these, this disorder is either termination at the edges of the grain boundaries, which in most cases um, we have good control over at this point, um, with CVD yielding you know, tens of micron size single crystals. Um, and for uh, bulk or for exfoliated materials, uh, edges haven't been necessarily a problem, except for in graphene, um, which is some very fringe cases of observing uh, very sensitive states. Uh, the other thing is an extrinsic disorder, um, uh, handling absorbates, which cause these nanobubbles, handling a, a excessive strain from the way that things are stacked, um, or dealing with air sensitivity. And then finally, point defects, um, which again, I will uh, reiterate are the main problem um, that's going on and what the ultimate focus of my talk will be. But first, let's just go over a little bit of a review of extrinsic defects. So extrinsic disorder, um, like the previous speaker mentioned, right, when things were grown on sapphire, for instance, um, that charged landscape is extremely disordered somewhere on the order of a few 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared in terms of charge disorder um, to one times 10 to the 12th um, uh, per centimeter squared. So um, this is really, really easily pictured uh, with something just on graphene on SIO2. Um, you can just see that this large variation here uh, and just a 50 by 50 nanometer um, continuously varies uh, throughout the image. And then you just put on something like hexagonal board nitride, uh, which has been the magic of the 2D community for the last uh, six years. Um, and all that charge disorder goes away. And then you can do some additional tricks um, with fabrication, especially in the case of graphene, um, where you can etch it particular ways, uh, or you can gate it with graphite gates, and then do what's called hall-defined hall gating, where you uh, define your uh, conducting regions electrostatically, and you really get the dis disorder down to its ultimate limit, which is the limit of, this, of the disorder in BN, 6 times 10 to the ninth per centimeter squared. Um, if you're very, very lucky with your device. Um, now, in TMDs, does this also hold true? Um, I think we haven't really been able to measure how well BN encapsulation ultimately works for TMDs. But what we can say is that it at least works down to at least 1 times 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared. And ultimately, the effects of HBN encapsulation work well enough to where we can observe li sharp lineless, uh, same photoluminescence of below even 2 MeV I think the lowest we ever observed was something like 1.4 or 1.2 MeV, um, which is actually good enough to observe the difference between very um, close uh, states in energy, like positive and negative trions, say an MOSE2 um, uh, is the example that I give here. Um, not only that, the other kinds of extrinsic disorder um, that's cropped up recently in the field uh, is uh, disorder from stacking inhomogeneities, uh, particularly in uh, low twist angle. For instance, by layer graphene, you can see here that the target angle is 1.9, but as it goes uh, through the material, even on just uh, 100 nanometer, basically, uh, across this image, uh, you can see drastic changes in the overall stacking angle. This problem also persists in TMDs, uh, particularly uh, at angles between 2 to 4 degrees as well. Um, and it's a problem that ultimately uh, us as a material science field have to start appro uh, have to approach one day if we want to realize anything that comes out of these twisted TMDs. Um, though I think people like uh, Jiwoon Park are really approaching this problem stacking in UHB might be one of those uh, solutions to at least making this uh, stacking angle more, more homogeneous. So with all that sort of uh, prefacing the talk, um, just to sort of lay out those challenges, some additional challenges are contacts to TMDs, um, which have, uh, have actually um, increased uh, or 
The progress in this, this end has increased substantially in the last uh, four years, um, but still, uh, even just getting the most perfect device to work is maybe something like one in five, and that's for the most simplistic designs of, of nano devices made from exfoliated material of the highest quality. Again, we, we, we uh, sort of the, the only way of, of reducing extrinsic disorder that's been um, pushed so far by our community is stacking and stacking in HPN. Um, but there's a lot of other materials that, that we need to work with um, and remains a challenge in 2D. And then ultimately, how do we achieve low disorder in the materials that we already have on hand, right? Um, so how do we actually achieve low disorder for the materials on hand? We have to actually look into the material and we have to accurately measure their defect densities. We have to assess the defect types and we have to then take this back into what we're doing um, and implement that knowledge to change our growth parameters, uh, much like you would expect with any synthesis method. Um, so the way that I've gone about doing this in the last few years is to choose one particular transition metal dicogenide system, count the defects with STM, or even in the most recent case um, with AFM, relook at the growth methods, and then compare these physical growth properties, and then fi ultimately fabricate heterostructures and see which one gives us the best properties in the end and see if that matches up with our point defect density. Um, so ultimately, that's what we're in the name of the game uh, uh, of what I'm doing is reducing point defects in uh, 2D materials, particularly transition metal dicalcogenides, um, but I hope to extend this to many other uh, materials um, as the community grows to explore them. So what is defect formation energy for point defects in transition metal dicalcogenides look like and how does that compare to graphite? So graphite itself actually um, has very large formation energies for these type of point defects. So the lowest energy sort of point defect that forms in graphite are what's called Stonewall's uh, defects and their formation energy can vary depending on how you calculate it from 4 EV all the way up to 5 or 6 EV, depending on the type of stonewall's defect. Now, for uh, TMDs, that's entirely different. So stonewall's defects are no longer the lowest energy uh, defect that you can obtain. Instead, it, you can intuitively just think about it in terms of vapor pressures. Um, like in the case when people were making gallium arsenide, the problem there was that the arsenic has a much, much higher vapor pressure than gallium, and keeping the arsenic in the gallium uh, was very, very difficult. So just thinking along those lines, um, the calcogen has a much, much higher vapor pressure at higher temperatures um, than the transition metal does. And so the idea is how do we keep the, transition, uh, the calcogen into the transition metal? And you can see this very, very easily by comparing them um, as you go more or less towards circuitometry, even at very, very high sulfur rich um, uh, uh, ratios, you still end up with a formation energy, which can vary again from two to three EV, depending on, uh, on your environment. And this is for MOS2, but it remains the same for WSE2. And there are many other papers that you can look up and they always have a formation energy for sel uh, selenium or sulfur vacancy. Uh, always in the range of two to three EV, and always the lowest hanging fruit in terms of a point defect. Now, uh, what we can do is we can just take a look at uh, the naturally mined MOS2. This was a paper published all the way back in 2016, and we can see whether or not that's the case, right? So if you just take a look at naturally mined MOS2, uh, the defect, the point defects are very prominent. They're very deep, um, high contrast compared to the surrounding environment. Uh, and they end up being just as one would expect, sulfur vacancies on the order of one times 10 to the 13th per centimeter squared. And then you can just take a different growth method, say like uh, CVD, uh, and compare and see, again, if sulfur vacancies are going to be the highest number. So for CVD, that still uh, holds true. But then if you switch growth methods, say to PVD, uh, you end up with getting anti-site uh, defects as being the largest number of defect. So that sort of pins us to a region of, you know, depending on our growth parameters, are we going to expect sulfur vacancies or are we gonna expect some kind of anti-site defect? 
Um, so then we can extend from MOS2 and we can just take and we can look at the commercial uh, WSE2. So for those uh, that don't really grow bulk single crystals, the way the commercial bulk single crystals are grown are grown through what's called chemical vapor transport, where essentially you put the material into a, a glass ampule, uh, you load everything in stoichiometrically, and then you put a halogen inside like iodine or use chlorine or bromine um, to lower um, the basically the vapor uh, the vapor point for for the transition metal. So you form these sort of low temperature metal halogens inside your ampule. Now, the pros of this is that it has fast uh, fast growth, large yields, and it reduces the growth temperature drastically. So usually these things melt around 1200 degrees C, which is above what most conventional things can handle in terms of sealing them inside of a furnace. Um, but ultimately what that means is that you end up with, an, uh, with a point defect density that looks something like this. So this is a 500 by 500 nanometer image. And basically the number of point defects is just uncountable. But I think if you were actually legitimately counting up, it's something like one times 10 to the 13th or two times 10 to the 13th, probably somewhere in there. Um, nonetheless, what this ultimately ends up correlating back to, as I showed, um, is that you end up, again, with a quantum yield on the order of 0.1%. So can we actually improve this? Uh, so what we can do is we can actually try to handle that uh, that calcogen vacancy, and we can grow this in excess calcogen or in a flux. So by flux, I don't mean just say uh, one to ten ratio, or uh, or just say one gram of uh, of selenium. What we're talking about is basically two grams of selenium and about 100 milligrams of transition metal. So a very, very, very low amount of transition metal to your calcogen. But ultimately, what that means is that the overall yield is going to be very low. And there's going to be a lot of vapor pressure in your ampule. And so there's a lot of safety that has to go into this and a lot of technique that has to go um, into making sure it remains that way. Uh, so um, now that was WSE2 that I showed. Um, and then ultimately what this ends up meaning is that when we try to handle the selenium vacancy, we end up seeing just one or what we initially thought, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later, what we initially thought was one defect type. This defect type was on the order of five times to the 10th per centimeter squared, which means that we improved by almost three orders of magnitude compared to the commercial stuff. Um, does this also hold true in other calcogen or selenium calcogen systems like MOSE2? And the answer is yes, if you just go from commercial um, again, you end up with something that's rather uncountable, but probably somewhere around 10 to the 13th per centimeter squared. And if you just even include a little bit of excess selenium in your chemical vapor transport, you can decrease this defect density down to about eight times 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared. And again, if you pull the same trick and you put in a whole bunch of selenium and you just grow it inside of the flux, um, you can decrease this down to about three uh, to five times 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared. Um, now, what I said was that basically we only have about one or two defects coming out of that image. And if you look into these defects um, at low temperature, I think in this case, this image was taken around 76 Kel uh, uh, Kelvin, what you end up seeing is that you don't actually have any calcogen vacancies. So that's a big success. We won there uh, by doing a flex growth. So, you know, your intuition sort of works there. And if you look at the actual density of states um, through DIDV and scanning tunneling microscopy, um, what you can see is that you have some kind, sort of calcogen antisite, um, uh, which is a donor, right? And then you have some metal vacancy, which ends up being some acceptor state, right? So, uh, or what we presumed was some metal vacancy. Um, so how do we actually go about proving this? It's very simple. You just simply take um, your material, you exfoliate it into a monolayer, you put it on a TEM, a TEM grid, um, you hope that the beam doesn't kill the sample, uh, and then you see um, a metal vacancy. All right, so ultimately, um, out of this image, we did end up verifying that metal vacancy. It's on the metal site. It's where we expect it to be. Um, but what we never saw um, 
was the anti-site on the Calcogen. Out of all the TEM images that we took, we never really saw this anti-site. And then if we just take a careful uh, more, uh, if, we, if we inspect this image a little bit more carefully, this previous image I showed for MOSC2, uh, what we can see is there's actually four or five different defects. And so this brings up a little bit of curiosity in your mind. You're like, well, I thought I was just handling calculated vacancies. I thought anti-sites and vacancies were going to be my main thing. And if I'd handled the uh, vacancies, uh, at least for the calcogen, um, then I should really only have two or three defects. So we looked into this a little bit more uh, uh, by either looking at WSE2 or MOSE2. And for WSE2, we saw the same thing. We end up seeing four or five different defects, even on large uh, scan image sizes. Sorry, this should have said 100 nanometers. Um, so this is a 500 by 500 nanometer image. And if we just look at 500 by 500, we see something like 1 uh, to 5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter squared defect density. Um, but these defects are very, very reactive um, to the tip voltage. Uh, they can change drastically with the tip voltage, um, which is still an open question of why. Um, and not only that, but what's expected in topography, they're very, very tall, something like 700 picometers, uh, 300 picometers. And we were really wondering what it, could, what it could be. And then once we actually took an even deeper look and we really carefully scanned these things at very uh, small scan sizes um, of around 50, to 50, uh, 50 by 50 nanometer, where we always sort of had atomic resolution, um, we also noticed shallow defects that we never picked up before. These are on the order of 20 to 30 picometers, and the density is around 3 to 5 times 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared. So this sort of matches up more with the MOSC2 that we had at our very best. So in 2019, basically, um, a few papers had come out by Weber Bargioni. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Bargioni's group at LBNL. Uh, fantastic papers actually suggesting chromium um, substitution on the tungsten site. Uh, which had very small sort of shallow defects, and then also oxygen substitution into vacancies. So whether or not, you know, at high temperatures, you constantly have calcogen leaving the material and oxygen is coming in. Once you cool down your material, it sort of just gets stuck there. And there's nothing that you can really do about it, no matter the thermodynamics uh, of cooling down slower and slower and slower. Um, and then this was also supported by some theory that was calculated way back in 2015 by a Chinese group. Um, uh, which showed that basically, while the selenium vacancy formation energy remains between two to three, once that's formed, um, the formation energy or the energy really needed to absorb the oxygen is much lower than that, um, ranging from high one point something to low two point something EV. Um, so it's really, really easy for oxygen to get absorbed into the system. And so with these two works, uh, we are really thinking that oxygen was the problem. And so what we wanted to do to solve that was just keep pushing the flux ratio. So essentially, we wanted to test different selenium um, vapor pressures inside the ampule and see by increasing the amount of selenium vapor pressure while, uh, whether or not we could force out uh, the chance for oxygen to get into the system. And so from going from 1 to 10 ratio for tungsten disolenide, uh, where 10 is the selenium and 1 is the tungsten, right, um, to 1 to 15 to 1 to 25, we saw a continuous decrease in this point defect density, uh, which we thought, OK, that's really a great win. And not only that, it shows sort of an ability to design our defect density, which is useful in other applications. Um, now, ultimately, again, still at our best, we had these shallow point defects. Uh, and it sort of didn't really matter. So once you push past 1 to 25, you go to 1 to 50, you still were saturating at this defect density that really didn't make sense with thermal dynamics. Because based on the formation energies, we would have expected something if we cooled really, really slowly. You know, 5 times 10 to the ninth, maybe we get stuck at the impurity density of the powders um, per centimeter squared. Uh, and so we really went down the rabbit hole with this. And uh, ultimately, what I ended up doing was going to a beam line, um, uh, the BNL one, uh, and took X-ray fluorescence on tungsten disalinate powder. And what I showed um, was calcium sort of always shows up, but chromium and iron were also uh, impurities in this system. However, uh, when I took X-ray fluorescence, 
on CVT um, and on just the metal powder itself, all of them matched up with the flux as well. So then that ultimately means that we're not even hitting the impurity limit of the powder, essentially with our point defect density being at 10 to the 11th per centimeter squared, thereabouts. So um, as many people who have been involved in a variety of growth uh, optimization uh, sort of experiments, it's a real, it's a real rabbit hole sometimes. Um, but ultimately, what we had to do is we just had to go back and we had to look at what the semiconductor industry went through with silicon. If you think about how silicon was optimized, it began with Tchaikovsky growth way back in the late uh, or in the early 1950s. And then to improve it and get it all the way down to what's now, I think it's 11N, right? Um, they had to isolate it from their crucible, essentially, right? They had to think about all the things that were inside that growth chamber. Um, and in this case, our growth chambers are quartz ampule, but not only were we using a quartz ampule, we were also using quartz and aluminum wool. Um, while quartz wool, you would sort of expect to start breaking down at around 1100 degrees C and maybe preemptively because of surface area with a quartz wool um, well before, uh, 1100 degrees C. Um, we were actually making our samples at around 1000 degrees C, and we were using aluminum wool, which we wouldn't expect to break down at much higher temperatures. Uh, nonetheless, what I ultimately ended up being was that quartz wool was this responsible uh, was responsible for these large defects that we were counting on the order of one times ten to the tenth per centimeter squared. But not only that, uh, they were responsible for the small shallow defects. What those impurities are, we may never know, but now we have a material that's on the order of one times 10 to the 10th per centimeter squared for tungsten diselenide uh, with very sparse large defects uh, that we can see in 500 by 500 nanometer scans. Again, these are very reactive to the tip. Um, they can be very tall, and it's still an open question about what these are, uh, but it seems that we're actually starting to reach the impurity limit um, because our MOSC2 is around five times 10 to the 10 to the ninth per centimeter squared. Um, and the MOC2, the MO powder, the metal powder that you purchase from this company, in this case, Alpha Azer, is just slightly cleaner than the tungsten powder, uh, or at least from what they quote. Um, so all of this now is starting to make sense. Um, and a lot of this work was actually pushed in the last six months after the coronavirus sort of shutdown of New York ended. Um, and uh, me, uh, and a postdoc that's still at Columbia um, sort of got to run our final experiments that were really started just, uh, just as I was leaving um, to start my new position. Um, so this is actually a huge breakthrough that we found in, like, uh, in about the last two months. Um, just to sort of compare this, again, CVD is 10 to the 13th. CVT ends up being 10 to the 12th. Um, if you include some excess selenium, 10 to the 11th, uh, high 10 to the 11th. And then we've gotten down to about 10 to the 10th. And if, again, if you just look at the powders and you calculate the impurity density that you would expect from what you purchase, um, we're now hitting that impurity limit, more or less. So probably the leftover impurities are likely either chromium or iron um, or some other metal like nickel. OK, so just a little bit of last things here. How do these improvements actually translate to improvements in the materials property? Um, instead of having something like 0.1, or maybe 1% quantum yield in MOSE2, we can get all the way up to 93% quantum yield is what we've measured so far in MOSE2 monolayers um, at low temperature. I think at room temperature, it's around 33%. Um, and then not only that, it makes things like measuring uh, uh, many body uh, exciton states much easier. Uh, in flux MOSE2, we can see bi-excitons, charged bi-excitons, um, and then there's actually some other low energy states um, uh, that uh, was recently found by Shadong Shu, uh, which I think he'll put on archive soon. Um, and finally, we can actually see uh, well quantized integer quantum Hall effect in monolayer WSE2, um, and even in uh, and even fr some fractional states in in monolayer WSE2 uh, if the stacks are made just right. Uh, and not only that, that's actually enabled us to see correlated states in twisted bilayer WSE2 um, with the first observations of superconductivity uh, at around four degrees twist angle. Um, now, 
Uh, how much further can we actually go? Can we push this uh, material uh, to a cleaner limit? Um, is there a point to even working with this material if we think about the application end of it uh, for single crystals, right? The single crystals that we produce right now is on the order of 0.5 millimeter to one centimeter in terms of grain size. Um, and that's our very best, right? Um, whereas if you take a look at silicon, right? This is basically a foot wide. It's as long as you ever want it. It's as much material as you can just fit in a room um, without hitting the ceiling at once. And, uh, and its defect density is something like 4.5 times 10 to the 11th per centimeter cubed. And if we translate the TMDs to that, the lowest that we've reached now is one times 10 to the 15th per centimeter cubed. So we're still four orders of magnitude off um, for making something as good as silicon. And the question is, you know, can we actually do more? Can we improve the metal? Can we do sort of these, um, uh, these zone melting techniques, go back basically to what people were doing in the 70s, purifying metals? Um, I think that's you know, still a very open question whether or not that's a worthy goal. Uh, on top of that, we can increase the throughput characterization of these. Um, for all the Im uh, images I showed before, they were all done by STM, um, but work done by Matt Rosenberger at Notre Dame, uh, or now at Notre Dame, um, using just conventional AFM techniques, uh, like conducting AFM has shown that you can actually observe point defects um, in monolayer TMDs just sitting on, uh, on basically a few layer graphene on a gold substrate, a very simple setup uh, without, with very little encapsulation and you can accurately assess the defect density, meaning that we can do fast through characterization and quickly implement uh, our results into our growth. Um, and then this is just an additional image to show that we achieved it on our own materials. And of course, this was actually one of our dirtier materials. Um, some outlooks, now that we actually have material that's on the order of 10 to 11th or 10 to the 10th per centimeter squared, we can uh, approach some of these larger exfoliation methods, um, which have shown good quality for CVT material, um, but it's not necessarily understood whether or not they cause defects um, on the order of the defect density that's already there in CVT materials. Um, a few highlight examples are exfoliation on gold, um, where potassium iodide is actually used subsequently to isolate the material. It's unknown how much potassium iodide actually affects TMDs in particular, um, and whether or not this method is viable for pr uh, producing centimeter-sized monolayers um, with better quality than CVD, if it is uh, indeed not affecting the material. Um, and then some other outlooks, a um, uh, newer one on the horizon was a uh, paper in Nature Materials, uh, which discussed uh, exfoliation by liquid PC. Um, uh, and it seems to show that they don't get extra defect densities um, based on their method. Uh, it remains to hold true when you use a really low defect density material. And if it does cause defects, it'd be interesting to study these defects and see how they change the material uh, with a more intrinsic material. And then I just want to sort of hit on what Evan Reed um, stated. There's a lot of materials out there. And the 2D uh, community has been sort of stuck with hexagonal materials and graphene for about 14 years. And it's my opinion that I think we should really, really start branching out. And I hope um, that I can really push to that end. So that's sort of my goal. Um, as I keep building up my lab and moving forward, I want to explore point defects and other materials, but I also want to explore all their other properties and work uh, with the community to characterize them. Um, and then I just want to say thanks uh, to all my collaborators, especially Abe and Jim's group, who I worked with closely, and Song, who I worked with extremely closely in the last uh, year and a half. OK. Thank you so much, Daniel, uh, for this really great talk. Uh, I personally learned a lot about uh, you know, how someone can hunt defects to this level. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, I think we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, and I invited the, the person who asked the question. Uh, my, my question is uh, how to, uh, to control the defects in one monolayer or two monolayers as you grow your material on the substrate uh, of your device? Yeah, so in this case, we're not actually growing the material on the substrate. We isolate the material later from bulk single crystals. 
um, either using the traditional scotch tape method, which has somehow remained uh, the dominant method of the field for an extraordinary amount of time, or by using other uh, methods like gold exfoliation. Uh, just for uh, exploration or by CVD or DVD, uh, you, uh, you make your uh, survey. Sorry? You use the technique of bottom up or, uh, um, uh, or top down? Uh, these are bulk materials, so we're exfoliating them onto the silicon oxide using mechanical exfoliation. Uh, please, one more question. Uh, how to, um, to make uh, just one monolayer uh, of uh, MO, uh, molybdenum disulfide? on uh, silicon substrate and to make uh, a transistor uh, or, hem, or like hemp structure? Um, I think to put that sort of succinctly, so that's a whole field in and of itself. Um, usually what we use is just extremely clean silicon oxide. We use a plasma that's been published several times um, to increase adhesion between the silicon oxide and the material that we exfoliate. Um, and typically for uh, if the material is on the order of, say, um, uh, five millimeters in terms of grain size, we can end up with monolayers using typical exfoliation on the order of 100 by 100 micron if we're extremely lucky. Um, but in most cases, something like 20 by 20. Um, but again, that depends on the material and the adhesion to silicon oxide. Please, uh, can, could we make uh, a draw technique like uh, molecular, molecular beam epitaxy? Uh, to, to get uh, such like uh, structure uh, with TMD material? Uh, so MBE of, uh, of at least two HTMDs is an active field. Um, I have a collaborator at UW-Madison that is working on that. Um, I think at this, probably one of his students is working on that at its very moment. Uh, for molecular beam epitaxy, um, there are two problems that lay there. One is grain size. Um, which tends to be limited to something like, you know, micron size, grain size. Um, and then defect density is still very hard to control for MBE due to the large difference in the vapor pressures of the materials used to grow. Um, so sort of the same problem that always comes back when you try to make a binary system um, for these direct band gap materials. Okay. Uh, Auden, do you have a question? Yeah. So first of all, you know, I really love the fact that you're pushing the, the material quality to its ultimate limits. You know, so much of the work in this field is throwing disorder on top of disorder. And, you know, we characterize and we get a number, but what does it actually mean? But so my question is, um, for lots of applications of these materials, let's say as a transistor, we really care about things like the work function. And so there, you know, it's not just, it, first thing we need to do is get to really high material quality. But then if we want to actually tune the work function, we ne now need to introduce the right kinds of defects, right? The things that will allow us to actually get to uh, a point where we're right at the threshold without affecting mobility too much. So do you have ideas on how we might approach increasing the right or introducing the right kinds of defects or which defects we should have in order to get for applications? Um, yeah, so um, there's a paper way back in 2000, I think 16. Um, I've read, there's a guy at Oak Ridge that does a lot of these growths and I should know his name. And unfortunately, for some reason, I just can't think of it right now. Um, but he does a lot of these doping of TMDs, uh, but uses CVT, but tries to keep recooking them and do recrystallization processes to get the defect density low enough to where you can actually reliably dope them, um, say with some kind of dopant. Uh, in most cases, um, people will use something like niobium. So they'll just go left or right of say molybdenum or tungsten to dope either hole or electron. Um, I can say that, uh, in CVD, this has been a very fickle thing, probably as you're aware of, probably because of, uh, of the defects basically counteracting this. Um, so yeah, we've approached that point and I think that's a good follow-up step. Now that we have this clean material, can we now reliably introduce small impurities into the growth and get, um, get reliable doping where, where, uh, where the Fermi level is already sitting in the conduction or the valence band and we can actually start, start implementing this um, for contacts and for various other things. 
or you know, can we actually take this and put this in UHV, and can we evaporate something in UHV uh, and dope it uh, when it's already a monolayer that's exfoliated in a macro-sized crystal? I was about to say, you know, contact doping uh, uh, as well, the env or environmental doping. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that basically requires, you know, sort of. Um, going along the same lines as Jiwoon, but even further, which is this, you know, put everything in UHV and start making your heterostructures in UHV and also implementing contact um, doping into that, uh, which is an idea I have to pursue for the future, but who knows if it'll play out. Great. All right. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Daniel.